off. We're in the book of Colossians, so if you guys want to turn with me to the book of Colossians, we're going to be uh, in chapter 3, verses uh, 1 through 17. We're going to look at those verses. So let's begin with a word of prayer. <coughs> Father God, we just praise you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for just allowing us to gather this morning, Lord, to, just to be here, just a privilege, Lord, to be able to hear your word, Lord. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what you have for us, Father God. Just uh, we thank you for your your word, the living Bible that's living and breathing, Lord. Just that it would change us, Lord. That it would make us more of who you want us to be, Father. That would be a light, Lord, in a, in a dark place, in a dark world, Father. We ask your blessing upon each and every one that's here this morning, Lord. And, and we pray for those who are unable to make it, Father. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if you turn in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be uh, looking at the life of a Christian. And I titled the message, Living the Christian Life. Don't get that mixed up with living the crazy life. I've heard that in Spanish. It sounds pretty funny. Uh, the author of this book, again, just to recap, is the Apostle Paul. He wrote this letter, this epistle, in about 60 A.D. to the church in Colossae. He's never been to that church, but through his uh, ministry in Ephesus, his time that he spent there, many have come to faith in Jesus Christ and, and they began fellowships and they be that grew into churches. And Epaphras was one of them who was the minister of the church of Colossae. Now Colossae went to visit Paul, who is now in prison, in Rome to tell Paul the heresy that's going on in the church. And what did Paul say when he heard this news? He said, what do you want me to do about it? I'm in prison. Yes. No, he didn't say that. He loves the brethren. He's not Saul, he's Paul, the Apostle Paul, who loves the brethren. And the Spirit just gave him this heart to write this letter, to write this epistle. He wanted to encourage them of who they are in Christ. So, he writes this letter and it gets delivered by his messenger, Tychicus, who was also the deliverer of the letter to the Ephesians. Now, some of the heresy that's going on is Gnosticism, which denies the deity of Christ. Judaism, which is the belief that works with faith in God is for salvation. And all this is just lies, keeping the church from growing spiritually. So here in chapter 3, he's writing that life as a Christian should not be the same as before we knew Christ. Our life should be so obvious that we belong to Christ, that others see it and they're drawn to it. It's by the way we, not just we present ourselves, how, how we live our lives, but what we do, what we say. Not doing the things that we used to do before we came to Christ, before we were saved. All those all satisfy the flesh. And right now that we are believers, we should be living in the spirit and starving the flesh. We make other changes in our lives by stopping one thing and starting another. And that's what Paul's going to write here in chapter 3. We need to stop doing one thing and start doing another. For instance, if, if we want to be healthier, we stop eating so much junk food and we start eating more fruits and vegetables. If we want to be more fit, we stop being lazy and we start exercising. We start going for walks and join a gym or something. And Paul's telling, them that, telling the church that they need to get rid of some things that that's going on in their lives. They need to get rid of it and they need to be, live a life in the spirit. The new person in Christ that they now are. 
So let's go ahead and, and begin in, in chapter 3, verse 1, where he writes, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, which where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. So if then, if you have been raised with Christ, See, he's speaking about being raised. Look, look at going up a few verses of chapter 2, of verse 20, where it says, Therefore you died with Christ. So in verse 20 of chapter 2, you died with Christ. And here in verse 1 of chapter 3, you were raised. That's the Christian life right there. Dying to yourself and being raised in Christ. Dying to the flesh and being ra raised in the spirit. There should be a difference. That alone right there, people should be able to see the obviousness that you belong to Christ now. You're no longer your old self any longer. Before Christ, we were de uh, dead spiritually because of sin. We were separated from God. But because of Jesus' death on the cross, we have resurrection of the spirit and from dead from being dead and we are now raised spiritually we allow too many things in our lives to stay the same as it was as when we were in the world there was there's, there's no change or very little change we cannot become a christian and still keep our sinful behavior Galatians 2.20 reads, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the life we should be living now. Let's look at uh, verse 2 through 4 of, of chapter 3, Colossians. It says, Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Do we seek to do that, to bring glory to God? Our lives are now hidden in Christ, it says. Even Paul wrote, to me, to live is Christ. The life that we live is a reflection of who we are in Christ, and it tells others what we believe. One day Christ will be revealed in glory. And in, this, in these verses we read, it says that we will also will appear with him in glory. Believers will share Christ's glory one day. So Paul is going to tell us now in these next verses... He's going to explain to us how a Christian should behave. And he tells us the things that need to be different in our lives. The things that we need to get rid of. Just to give you a little... Uh, things about what he's going to speak about is three major points. One of them is sexual immorality... The second one is coveting, and the third is sinful speech. Those three are the biggest strongholds that affect the unity of the church. And they became a problem in the church in Colossae.
The first one he's going to address would be sexual immorality. immorality. God designed sex to be between one man and one woman in the context of marriage. It's clearly stated in the Bible. And anything outside of that is sexual sin. And let's look at verse 5 where he speaks about that. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So Paul says in verse 5 to put it to death, these things. He doesn't tell us to try to control them, but to put it to death. If you kill something, it's not going to come back. If you try to control it and put it aside, you're liable to pick it up again. So sexual immorality should not be a characteristic of a Christian. All these things, sexual activity is, is, is just immoral when it's done outside of God's design that we talked about. What you're saying to that person when you, when you, when you fall into these fornication and uncleanliness and passions and evil desires, when you fall into these, you're telling that other person that you're not a person, you're an, you're an object. Instead of waiting for God's perfect timing in marriage, when a couple gives themselves fully to each other, that's what God's design is. The world tells us differently. The world tells us it's okay. Everybody's doing it. You know, just live together and have kids. And but Paul says, put it, put it to death. Don't give in. Don't give in to these uncleanness and passions and evil desires. Don't give in to none of those because they start to grow. <coughs> when you feed it and you water it, it starts to grow and it gets a hold of you. Stay away from it. You guys know the story of, of Joseph with Potiphar's wife. What did he do? He, he fled. He ran from it. He even left his coat behind. If you want to read about that, it's in Genesis 39. You play with fire, you're going to get burned. Then he talks about, in the ending of verse 5, he goes from sexual immorality to coveting when he writes and covetousness which is idolatry when we covet we want things that others have we're saying that God can't satisfy our needs we start, we start making things possessions, we start making them idols, we start wanting certain things rather than finding our contentment in the Lord. Paul gives two reasons why we need to put these things to death, and they're found in verse 6 and 7, so let's look at that. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. The wrath of God, God's anger, it will come down on the sons of disobedience. Sexual immorality and, and covetousness will not go unpunished. And the second reason is in, in verse 7. 
in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. We're not the same person anymore. We're a child of God now. We don't have to do those things we used to do before we came to Christ. We could say no to sin. Before we were slaves to sin. We did whatever our flesh wanted us to do. But now in the spirit, we could say no. We know that the Bible tells us that anyone being in Christ, he is a new creation. We're not the same person anymore. Galatians 5.25 says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Paul's reminding us that those sinful acts, Christ died for those. He has set us free from them. And the third thing that's crept into the church that Paul addresses is the sinful speech. Let's look at verse 8. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. We're to put those off. Anger is a strong spirit of dislike, a feeling of hatred. Wrath is an intense form of anger involving violent outbursts. Malice is ill will, is spite, taking pleasure in seeing others suffer. And blasphemy is speaking words slanderous, filthy language is shameful speaking. It is lewd, indecent, disgraceful, and impure. Just using curse words all the time. Paul tells us to put off these things. He wants us to remove them from our lips. Verse 9 says, And do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Some struggle with telling lies all the time, thinking nobody would know, but God knows. When we, when we lie to someone, we break the trust that we've had with them. And that trust is hard to get back. Lying to one another destroys the unity. Which means you can no longer work together as a team. We gotta remember that out of the heart the mouth speaks. Have you ever felt justified in saying something mean to somebody and you wanted to say it but you you held back and you didn't say it and you said you felt good about yourself. Oh good, I didn't I didn't say it. But then it crept up again. And then you say it. And you just tear that person down. 
It just makes you feel awful after. It's the spirit that convicts us afterwards. Why did I say that? You know, it's too late. It's like a gun. Once that bullet comes out, you're not going to get it back. Especially when the other person doesn't say anything back. That silence it just kills. Like, man. <laughs> so we've got to control what we say. In James chapter 3, talks about the un tameable tongue, how it is unruly and evil, full of deadly poison. James says, one moment we, we bless God, our Father, and the next moment we are cursing man who was made in God's image. James says, that should not be so. Now that we've put to death and we've put off these 12 things of sexual immorality and, and covetousness and, and, and sinful speech, Paul tells us we have to put something on now. Now that we've got rid of those things, what do we put on? In verse 10 it says, And, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. In verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, nor free, but Christ is all and in all. <coughs> so put on the new man, Who's, who's renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. We belong to Christ now. And in verse 11 it talks about there's no race or gender, nationality when it comes to Christ. Salvation is for everyone. The Bible talks about so God so loved the world. And the end of verse 11 says, Christ is all and in all. He's everything we need. And then uh, in verse 12 it says, Therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. We'll stop right there. So these, what Paul is telling us to put on now, He says to put on tender mercies. So to have a heart of compassion, the tender mercies is. Put on kindness, which is an unselfish spirit of doing for others, an attitude of goodwill. Put on humility, not being proud. Put on meekness, having a quietness of yourself, gentleness. In long suffering, having patience, perseverance in suffering while showing a kind attitude towards others. And then verse 13, bearing with one another, having patience with others failures, an odd way of doing things be because of it's not the way you would do it. 
you got to bear with one another. And that's, especially when it comes to marriage. We're so easily looking at others' faults rather than looking at our own. We think that we put up with somebody else's faults, but what about them putting up with our faults? And then also in 13 it says that we need to be forgiving one another. Do we have that forgiving heart? Jesus forgives us our faults. He forgives us our failures. And he doesn't bring them back. He forgets them. We can't do that. It's hard for us. Let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. We want God to always forgive us. We're always praying when we mess up. But we're so, so hard for us to forgive others when they've done wrong to us. In verse 13 also it says, if, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. Verse 14, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. That love he's speaking about there is that agape love. Which is put on agape love. The love that doesn't expect anything in return. We know First Corinthians thirteen, the love chapter. Let's go ahead and turn to that real quick. First Corinthians thirteen. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love. I become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. It is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Take that the word love out and put your name in there. So beginning at verse 4, I'm going to put my name on there. Danny suffers long and is kind. Danny does not envy. Danny does not parade it itself and is not puffed up. It's, I mean, that's tough to go on and on and put your name in there. Now, 
Now go back and, and put God's name in there. God suffers long and is kind. God does not envy. God does not parade itself and is not puffed up, does not behave really, and does not seek its own. That's all God is. That's who God is. God is love. We need to pray that we be more loving towards others. That's how the Bible says that people will know who you belong to by the love you have for the brethren. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 3. In verse 15, And let the peace of God ruin your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the peace of God ruin our hearts. Who gives that peace? God gives that peace. God gives us rest. And in everything, he says to give thanks. Not for everything, but in everything. Knowing that God's in control. And he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And it says to... In verse six, 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom. How do we do that? Through his word. We've got to be in his word daily. Verse 16. Teaching and admonishing, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We have a duty to share the word with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Encouraging one another. Giving godly counsel. Giving the word. And singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Praising God for who he is. That's the life we should be living now. A spirit-filled life, praising God. In verse 17, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through Him. Whatever we do, whatever we say, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. We need to get rid of the, the heaviness of sin that's weighing us down. We need to put on Christ. You know, Matthew eleven twenty-eight through 30 tells us to come to him, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and he will give us rest. He says that my yoke is easy, my burden is light. That's a Christ life we should live. With a <coughs> easy yoke and a light burden, not weighed down by sin. So why do Christians fall into this sexual immorality and coveting and sinful speech? Why is it they fall into that? It's a, it's a belief. It's a belief that those things will bring satisfaction to uh, what we're feeling, what we're going through. But it's all a lie from Satan. Only a life hidden in Christ will bring joy and fulfillment. Listen. 
So what do we as Christians need to do? We need to fall more in love with Christ. You know the Bible talks about he first loved us, he chose us. We need to be in his word. Three steps, be in his word. Step two is to be in prayer. And step three, to be in fellowship. That's how we're going to fall more in love with Jesus Christ. If we're in his word, we're allowing God to speak to us. If we're in prayer, we're, we're, we're allowing God to hear us, hear our hearts, because he wants to spend time with us. And if we're in fellowship, we're keeping each other accountable. We're, we're allowing ourselves to be uh, used by God to lift each other up, to encourage one another, to pray for one another. When, do, when we're doing those three things, it'll keep the sinful life that we used to have out and we'll be putting on these new things that Paul tells us to put on. First Peter 1.16 says, Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. We can't compromise when it comes to sin. I want to close with two verses. Romans 6.12. Let's look at Romans 6.12. It says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it in its lust. Don't, don't allow it. And Ephesians 5.8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children in the light. Mm. 